This is Brain Ponderings with Mark Matson. Conversations with scientists at the forefront of brain research. Today, it's uh, my pleasure to talk to an old friend and uh, lab mate, uh, Justin Lathia, who's now a professor at Cleveland Clinic, where he uh, holds an endowed chair for neuro-oncology at the Lerner Research Institute, which is uh, an effort by Cleveland Clinic to meld preclinical studies, you know, basic work, for example, in animal models, with coming up with some ways, new ways to treat disease. Uh, Justin is uh, focusing on brain tumors and particularly glioblastoma, which is uh, one of the nastiest tumors anybody can get because uh, the survival rate is extremely low. Uh, before you start talking about glio glioblastoma though, Justin, can you, kind of enlighten our viewers on your background and where you grew up. Did you have parents who were interested in science or medicine? And then go on and talk about, you start out in neuroscience, but then now you're focused a lot on cancer research. Yeah, no, great. You know, it's always great to see you, Mark. Um, so my background is, you know, my parents are originally from India. My dad came in the late sixties to do an advanced degree in engineering. So I grew up uh, in central Pennsylvania, uh, in Lancaster County, near, near Hershey, near Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And uh, I was always interested in, in math and science. Um, and my first degree is actually in biomedical engineering. So just like my father, I, I actually went to engineering school. Um, and I ended up doing a dual degree in um, biomaterials and tissue engineering. So I, I got very interested in you know, this idea, can we engineer uh, biological systems, and a lot of it was involving drug development. So I spent some time in the pharmaceutical industry uh, during my undergrad as well. Ended up doing a master's thesis in cancer biology in how um, how ultrasound guided microparticles could bind to newly developed vasculature. And this is right in the heyday of angiogenesis. And after that, I got very interested in um, stem cell biology. And I was lucky enough to get into an NIH program that was half NIH, half Oxford or Cambridge. Um, so I did my thesis actually in neural development uh, with a group in, at Cambridge, but also I was lucky enough to be in Mark's lab uh, for the second half of my thesis, which was uh, an absolutely incredible experience from a neuroscience perspective. Just that, you know, the, the breadth and depth of neuroscience in, in your lab, Mark, was incredible. And then Right around the same time, you know, I think we as a field had an issue about were we ever going to make cell transplantation for neurodegenerative diseases a reality? And I think there's still a struggle. But what was interesting to me is that the glioblastoma field in particular was in dire need of better therapies. And there was this idea that maybe stem cell programs emerged in these tumors. So I ended up doing a postdoc at Duke. Uh, right after your lab, obviously, Mark. And then the lab moved to the Cleveland Clinic. So I went to Duke in 08, came, came here in 09, and I've been here ever since. Um, and, you know, happy to talk about it in more detail, but our, our lab still studies these, these stem cell-like programs in these malignant cancers. Uh, but we also are now thinking about a wide variety of other ways that glioblastoma continues to vex us. So that, that's sort of, in a nutshell, my background. Can you just kind of quickly summarize like the clinical picture of someone who develops a glioblastoma? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, in general, um, they'll present with a headache, a seizure, uh, some other incidental event, and then they'll get a scan. And, you know, the majority of time, there's a reasonable idea of what it could be. Um, but essentially what happens is a biopsy is taken. And what, what the... Um, the neuropathologist looks for, uh, you know, our hyperproliferation. Um, they look for things called pseudopalisading necroses, uh, aberrant vasculature. So you start checking those boxes histologically, uh, you are considered to have a glioblastoma. There is some molecular testing that goes on, 
But once that occurs, it depends on the region in the brain the tumor is found. Uh, the next step is really maximal safe surgical resection, right? So this is complicated because it's in the brain. It's not, it's not a peripheral tumor that you can remove the whole organ. So what happens is the tumor is resected. There's some time that's given to heal. And then there's concomitant radiation and chemotherapy. And, and the major chemotherapy used is an oral alkylating agent called temozolomide. Um, and then basically what happens is, is we sort of wait, figure out the trajectory of the tumor. Unfortunately, recurrence occurs. So the next step then is clinical trials. And there's a wide variety of clinical trials going on. And, and one of the things to note, and, and glioblastoma in particular is very interesting, there are national cancer center guidelines that if you're diagnosed with a tumor, you know, the clinicians will use. For glioblastoma, actually, one of the first things they talk about is get into a clinical trial. I think that's, that's the aggressiveness of the disease. So hopefully that kind of gives your, your viewers a, a rough idea of the clinical trajectory. Okay, so how do you work to understand what's going on in these tumors that leads to their growth and then to their spreading of the, the yeah. cancer? Yeah, so I think a lot of it comes down to models, right? So for example, one of the things that the field has been lucky in a way is that these tumors are really malignant. So it is very possible to actually get patient resections and develop models ex vivo, right? So we can take tumor resections, we can grow them in culture, much easier than the stuff we used to do in your lab, much, much easier. They require very little uh, trophic support, right? So you can extract these cells, you can culture them in a dish, you can culture them three-dimensionally as what we call these tumor spheres or, or neurospheres. Um, you can culture them as organoids. So uh, another great example. And then what we do is we routinely generate patient-derived xenograft models, right? So we can transplant them into immune-compromised mice and propagate them. So, so that's sort of the human side. There's also the mouse modeling side. And again, you know, the challenge with glioblastoma is the molecular genetics are extremely messy. It's not a single oncogene. It's not a single driver. It's not that standard two-hit hypothesis that a lot of cancers, you know, follow. This, this tumor does not follow any of those rules. So there is a wide variety of genetically engineered mouse models that are used. Um, you know, again, mouse genetics is extremely elegant. So, you know, the field has been able to make inducible models, uh, you know, time-dependent models, electroporation models and embryos, uh, all of that. Um, but, you know, those sorts of systems are better used to understand uh, immune interactions, for example. So I think we have a, a wide variety of approaches at our disposal. Um, but, you, you know, the idea is, right, we're interested in cellular and molecular mechanisms. So whether it's patient tissue or these mouse models, um, you know, the laboratory-based studies are, are really using these approaches. And, and oftentimes we like to go back and forth, right, you know, using human samples to generate a hypothesis, coming into the mouse system to validate it, and then really saying, okay, does this actually happen in human patients? And so there are a variety of different cell types in the, the brain, the normal brain. There's neurons, which don't divide. There are glial cells called astrocytes that can divide. There are stem cells, which you studied in my lab, yeah. which can divide. Is it known which cells, from which cells the cancer cells arrive? It's a great question. My short answer is I think it's more than one cell type. And here's the reason why. So um, again, using mouse models, right? One is able to manipulate, you know, a glial progenitor, an astrocyte, a neural stem cell in a variety of ways, and then get a lesion that looks like a glioblastoma, hmm. right? So we have to be very careful because it's almost a circular argument, right? So if I mess with an astrocyte and I get a glioblastoma, right? Then I'll say, oh, the cell of origin is an astrocyte. Well, well, of course, it's because that's the cell I messed with. Yeah. So I think, you know, instinctually, I think it is multiple, um, it's multiple cell types. Okay. Now, I'll go a step further. And, and really, what's interesting is that there are certain types of glioblastoma, you know, it's, it's still not as clean as breast cancer in terms of the classification. Um, but one idea that I, personally, I have is that I think that 
certain types of glioblastoma from a molecular standpoint are likely arising from a different cell of origin. So it is kind of an interesting idea to think, okay, well, you know, we might have tumors that are driven by, let's say, three classes of genes or have sort of three genetic signatures. My thought is they're actually coming from three separate cell types. Okay. And then one long time ago, I was thought when you have a cancer a tumor that all the cells in the tumor are pretty much the same. They're like clones of each other. Mm -hmm. But it's pretty clear now that <laughs> there's a lot of variability of cell types within the tumor and that there's actually maybe some, it's almost like a, an old whole an organism unto itself in a sense. Can you talk about that heterogeneity of cells? Yeah, I mean, I think you're, you're speaking to this idea that cancer can manifest as an aberrant organ, right? So if you use that as a thought paradigm, organs are driven from development and homeostasis through a distinct population of stem and progenitor cells. So I think the same thing is happening in, in, in glioblastoma. There are populations of self-renewing cancer stem cells that um, are doing a lot of things. They're driving tumor growth, they're driving therapeutic resistance. Now, what's interesting is it was initially thought that you know, there's one population, um, you know, just like in the developing brain, right? You know, for example, in the mouse brain, aligning the ventricles or, you know, in the dentate dryers in the hippocampus. But what's interesting is I think that there's actually multiple competing clones of cancer stem cells in different populations. So a lot of single cell sequencing has been done to really try to map this out. And I think it is, it's really well appreciated that there are these populations of cancer stem cells. Um, but I think they, they come in different flavors, come in different spectrums. So it's just, um, you know, it's just something to consider. Uh, I think it's a little bit more complicated than, but, but, but nonetheless, there are these populations of cells that are really driving tumor growth and therapeutic resistance. Are, are the, the cancer stem cells kind of scattered throughout the tumor? And then the second part of the question would be, um, do those cancer stem cells like migrate out of the tumor? Let me answer the first question first. So I don't think they're randomly distributed, right? Okay. So, you know, we and others have done a bunch of work and we think they're just like in the normal brain, they're in distinct anatomical locations or niches, right? So one is a perivascular compartment, right? The other is a hypoxic compartment. There is thought that they're also present in the necrotic compartment. And these tumors are highly invasive. So, you know, there is some evidence that there may be populations of cancer stem cells that are sort of at the leading edge of, of migration. So, you know, it depends on the marker you use. It depends on the lineage tracing. It depends on the model system, but they are in distinct areas. They're not randomly distributed throughout the tumor. You mentioned the term angiogenesis um, earlier on, the growth of blood vessels, and these cancer cells have some way of stimulating the, the blood vessels to grow into the tumor. And yeah. you've, you've studied this a little bit in terms of these cells around the blood vessels, the parasites. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So, you know, unfortunately, it hasn't borne therapeutic fruit, but um, there's a well, lot. No, of nothing has really yet. Yeah. Right? yeah. So, you know, there's a lot of evidence. So one of the things to remember is that, you know, to be a glioblastoma, you've got to have aberrant vascular proliferation. And these tumors are highly vascularize when they're removed, there's a lot of blood. Um, so there's a lot of work that's going on that has suggested that tumor cells can secrete factors that recruit blood vessels. So, so that is, is really, um, that's really well established and well known. Um, and I, I think, you know, when I first started in the field in, you know, the mid to late 2000s, anti-angiogenics, which were actually showing promise in other advanced cancers, um, you know, were being tested aggressively in glioblastoma. And unfortunately, they've, they failed for a variety of reasons. They are used in recurrent tumors more as palliation than anything else. Um, but I think, you know, there are still some people working in this area and it, it is a very interesting uh, area in terms of basic science, right? How is it that the tumor and, and you know, for example, cancer stem cells are actually better at this, um, at attracting blood vessels. Yeah. So it's, it's an area of active investigation. Yeah. 
And you mentioned the term hypoxia, like low, low oxygen levels. Yeah. And so within the tumor, there's these regions with, I guess, less blood supply, less oxygen coming from the blood. And those cells seem to do well in that environment. So um, are there stem cells in that hypoxic region too? Yeah. yeah, there are. I mean, the one thing that we we always struggle with, right, when we try to model the disease, right, atmospheric oxygen is right, obviously above twenty percent. In the brain, as you probably know, the oxygen level is much lower to begin with, and it, within a tumor, it's even lower. So you know, you're talking somewhere between one and five percent. And and as you know, when you get that low, you start activating cellular responses to hypoxia, mainly through a series of factors called hypoxia inducible factors, right? The Nobel Prize was given for this a couple of years ago, um, you know, for the discovery of this. So, you know, there's an idea that these hypoxia inducible factors and the signaling involved in them is actually elevated in cancer stem cells. Um, so, you know, it is a bit of a chicken or egg uh, debate right now, but, you know, the question is in those hypoxic regions, why are there cancer stem cells? Did everyone else die and they're the only ones remaining? or are they particularly tuned to survive in that environment? Talk a little bit more about, let's go a little into the molecular level and, okay. and, and the environment. So there are a number of factors in the environment, some of which you actually studied in my lab a little bit uh, with normal stem cells in the brain. And so, so go ahead, the, the different, environmental factors that seem to, I guess it's interplay between the, the cancer cells and the cells, normal cells in the brain and how the cancer cells take advantage of those normal cells. Yeah, I mean, you know, one of the, the things to think about is that, let's talk about the immune system, right? So I'll, let's start there, but I also wanna eventually talk about toll-like receptors. Okay. So if we think about the immune system, um, what's interesting is that these tumors are highly immune suppressed. And what, what ends up happening is the tumor cells are secreting high levels of immune suppressive factors. So we know that they're growing in the brain, right? So there's immediate access to microglia. And what's interesting is microglia are becoming polarized to become pro-tumorgenic. The infiltrating monocytes, which then differentiate into macrophages, you know, end up having a similar uh, trajectory. So there's a very interesting interplay there. And what's also interesting- And these, the, the, these microglia are essentially macrophages in the brain and there's- Yeah. They can be like in a nasty inflammatory state. And this has been studied with respect to their interaction with neurons too, where there seem to be yeah. good state and bad state. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's all, it's all about polarization states. And what what's, ends up happening is, the, whether it's the macrophages, the, the microglia, they all get very, very potently polarized to a pro-tumorgenic state. So essentially what happens is instead of attacking tumor cells, they start supporting tumor cells by secreting additional factors that actually drive tumor growth. Uh, so you have this vicious cycle. You know, and we've been interested in subsets of these or other lineages of the myeloid family called myeloid-derived suppressor cells. Um, so you know, I could talk your ear off about those. We think those are also very important. They're important both within the, the tumor itself as well as systemically. And, and the thing to realize about glioblastoma in particular is you know, it depends on the markers, the models you use. 30, 40 plus percent of the actual tumor mass is myeloid cells, right? It's not just a mass of tumor cells. It's, it's a very corrupted yeah. environment. So, so that, that's one example of this microenvironmental interaction. You know, another, yeah. another that we've studied, which has actually taken us by surprise, but actually work in your lab should, you know, really lay the foundation is when these tumors are growing, there's actually a lot of necrosis, right? These, they're just, huh. they're in the brain, so they're constrained. So what happens is the tumors are growing and there's just a lot of cell death because it's a harsh environment. Now, we know that when cells die, they send out damage signals, right? So these are classically known as damage associated molecular patterns. Um, you know, let's just call them damage signals. I don't want to get too, too much into the jargon. Now, what's interesting is that evolutionarily, cells have evolved a way to sense and respond to damage. Now, think about it for a second. If there's an area of damage, 
systemically, right, the cells around it are going to sense that damage. And one of the first things they do is they stop dividing, right? They want to kind of wait for the immune system to come in. Because if you think about it, if you're in an area where it's damaged, it's evolutionarily disadvantageous to start growing, right? You put your lineage at risk. You put the progeny of your cells at risk. But in glioblastoma, cells don't care. And for example, cancer stem cells really don't care. And what we found years ago is that those cancer stem cells actually have low levels of toll-like receptor 4, right? Toll-like receptor 4 actually senses and helps respond to damage. So this sort of helped explain why cancer stem cells could continue to persist in damaged environments. And in your lab, remember, I don't know if you remember that Journal of Neuroscience paper, we found that actually when you knocked out toll-like receptor 3, you actually got hyperproliferation in the embryonic brain. Yeah. And are, are any of the, the pro-cancer factors that are produced by the microglia also, what, what are, are any of them beneficial for neurons as well? Possibly. It's not something we've been thinking about too much. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I'm glad you brought up this neuron um, idea. So I don't know if you've been seeing the literature. There's this booming field called cancer neuroscience. Um, and there's a lot of ideas now that, for example, astrocytes can interact with tumor cells. You know, we're starting to work in this area a little bit. There's a series of beautiful papers showing that there can be some electrical coupling between neurons and tumor cells. Um, and, you know, your favorite um, neurotransmitters, right? GABA, glutamate, dopamine, serotonin. There's all interaction there as well. So I think that, you know, I'm looking forward to the next couple of years to figure out uh, hmm. the extent to which tumor cells are really forming networks with, um, with neurons. Has it, anyone looked to see if the, the cancer the cells in the glioblastoma, the stem cells or otherwise have receptors for neurotransmitters? Yeah, I mean, I think this has been well recognized for a while oh, okay. that, that they do. But the, the, the key thing is the coupling and electrical activity is really being better resolved now. So this coupling you talk about is, so cells, they touch each other, their membranes touch, and there's these pores that form between the two cells. They're called gap junctions. And um, we did, who was it? Uh, A. Wu Cheng in my lab did some work yeah. su suggesting that uh, in normal stem cells in the developing brain, these gap junctions play an important role in keeping the cells in a self-renewing proliferative state. And if you use certain methods to disrupt those gap junctions, then the cells won't keep dividing. And it even actually promoted their differentiation. So talk a little bit about the gap junctions in the- Yeah, the I'm really glad you brought that up. So essentially, it, it, you know, actually a lot of AWU studies really inspired some of the things we've been thinking about, I'd say for the last decade. Um, so what's interesting is that she studied a gap junction protein called connexin 43, right? So this is, this comes together. So six of these, once they're assembled, membrane proteins come together and form a connexon and a connexon on one cell can dock with a connexon on another. Now, what's interesting is I would say early 2000s, uh, a series of observations right around the time that, you know, AWU and others were thinking about this, they looked in glioblastoma and they said, wait, there's low levels of connexin 43. Now, this fits a hypothesis that's been going on for 50 plus years where cancer cells have lost the ability to form gap junctions. Mm -hmm. This was first done, I think, in a canine kidney cancer model. Um, but essentially, there was this idea that connexins and gap junctions were tumor suppressive. Now, this doesn't make biological sense. It didn't make biological sense to us, right? So one of the hallmarks of glioblastoma is enhanced cell density. Now, if you have enhanced cell density, you would assume you'd have an increased ability for the cell-cell communication. And if you think about tumor cells and the fact that they're an aberrant ecosystem, they should be able to have this communication so they can have the plasticity, right? They can move as a group. They can do all of those things. 
So we revisited this hypothesis and we demonstrated uh, a couple of, you know, several years ago that in fact, our cancer stem cells are actually networked, right? We did all of the experiments that the classic field would do. You micro inject yeah. a dye that's gap junction permeable and you can see the network occur. We took in our models uh, a bunch of gap junction inhibitors. Now we should note that there's no super good gap junction inhibitors, right? Anything that messes with membrane fluidity as a side effect impacts gap junctions. So we used all the inhibitors the field uses and, and we said, okay, look in our preclinical models, fine. There's actually a reduction in tumor growth in cancer stem cell behavior when you use these inhibitors. Now the question is, which connection is it? So we did a bunch of qPCR screens. We used normal neural stem cells, human cancer stem cells, their non-stem progeny. And we actually found connection 46 mm -hmm. was quite important. Connexin 46 is, is part of the same family as Connexin 43. It's actually expressed in really hypoxic areas. So for example, in your eye, in your cartilage, in your knee, high levels of 46. So we used genetic loss of function studies to demonstrate that 46 was absolutely essential for stem cell maintenance. So that was one paper. You know, we took it a step further and said, okay, how do we drug this? Um, so we did probably the world's worst drug screen. We, we took HeLa cells and we put individual connections in um, and basically what we, we did a huge drug screen and, and we actually found that um, some antifungals actually were 46 trophic and then you know we could reduce the growth um, of tumors in, in some of the models using something called clofazamine. Um, so you know the, I think the field is that, that, that's a good that's a good great drug screen. Well, that's it, a, that's it, a, it seems straightforward, simple. It, it, it was, but it wasn't, you know, so what we did was we engineered cells with either 43 or 46, and we chose a couple other connections as our back screen. Uh, yeah. It was just labor intensive because uh. the screen itself was an imaging screen, Mark. This was crazy. So uh. what, what you do is you have unlabeled cells as a feeder layer, and you have your labeled cell that's labeled with two dyes, one that can't leave the original cell and one that's gap junction permeable. Huh. And then you basically put it down and you watch the dye transfer maybe over six hours. Uh, and then we did this with 700 plus drugs in a good, good, good job for a graduate student. Uh, actually, it was a series of technicians and a postdoc that ended up doing it. But yeah, it was yeah. It, it was uh, they were not happy. It, yeah. it took a long time. But but, you know, we got some hits out of it. Um, OK, talk a little bit about then the. So you're talking about interactions between the cancer cells. Talk about the, in, in my lab, you studied these cell adhesion molecules yeah. uh, on the, in the membrane called integrins that interact with this protein matrix outside the cell. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, the, the first couple projects I did as a postdoc was really sort of templating what we did in your group. Um, and the same thing, and essentially what we found is that in human samples, uh, CD49F, which is also known as integrin alpha-6, um, was really able to select prospectively cells that were cancer stem cells. So we, you know, we, we had a paper there showing, because at the time, you know, we, we didn't have a, a uniform marker and spoiler alert, we still don't have a uniform marker for cancer stem cells. But we showed that uh, 49F was, was, you know, was just as good, if not better, then the markers at the time, for example, CD133 and CD15. Mm -hmm. But what's interesting is that you can actually target 49F. We did it with the blocking antibody. We did it with genetic loss of function. Um, so, so, so that's where we're at there. Hmm. And, but we took it a step further and then we basically characterized the tumor microenvironment. So we said, okay, we, we have the receptor, what's the ligand? And what we were able to actually show was the ligand was uh, different laminin chains, mainly laminin alpha two, was enriched in the perivascular compartment. Um, so that was another paper. And essentially, you know, we kind of made the argument that when laminin and alpha-2 is around, um, cancer stem cells actually can, can be maintained, but also are therapeutically resistant to things like radiation. But the challenge is you really can't take it much further because integrin alpha-6 and laminin alpha-2, I, I mean, they're highly expressed in the brain, right? When I was a student in your lab, we showed all of this. So if you're gonna target something, you've got to find something unique. So we actually did a flow cytometry screen, an unbiased screen, and we actually found a novel cell surface receptor that hadn't been studied 
in brain tumors called F11 receptor, also known as CD321, also known as junctional adhesion molecule A or JAMA. And we've been working on JAMA for the last 10 years. Uh, you know, it turns out it's necessary and sufficient for self renewal, and you can target it. There's blocking antibodies. And what's really cool is that it actually forms in a complex with integrin alpha 6. Um, so, you know, it, it is a way for integrin alpha 6 to remain on the cell surface and remain functional. So we've been doing a lot with JAMA recently. Um, and, and that's sort of that, those studies have taken us in some really unexpected areas. So after the cancer stem cell studies, we wanted to know what JAMA was doing in the tumor microenvironment. It actually turns out that JAMA is also expressed by microglia. So, you know, when we started doing studies in microglia knockout, uh, or sorry, JAMA knockout mice, um, my initial hypothesis is, was, you know, it's not that other people had shown that it's expressed on microglia and, and in tumors. And I, you know, the thought is, look, it's not that important in microglia. Boy, was I wrong. So it turns out that there's a sex specific difference. So female JAMA knockout microglia are hyperactive and drive tumor growth. It, it, it's something that we're still working on, but that really got us into this idea of sex differences in cancer. Um, and I'm more than happy to talk your ear off about that as well, if, well, if you the, think there's an interest. Yeah, talk about that. So our, our men, is there a sex difference in the likelihood of someone getting glioblastoma or if they get it, their likelihood of surviving? The answer is yes to both. So it turns out that males get glioblastoma 1.6 times more frequently than females. That males that have glioblastoma actually do worse when you adjust for all clinically relevant variables. So you already have this epidemiological difference. Now, as a neuroscientist, I know you know that there are sex differences in darn near every cell in our brain, every lineage of cells. Neurons, yes. Astrocytes, yes. Microglia, gosh, yes. Oligodendrocytes, probably it needs to be studied further, right? So we're already at this difference of the environment. Now, what's wild in glioblastoma is the suite of mutations and the threshold for transformation is also having a sex difference. The epigenetic state of these tumors is also displaying a sex difference. And what our lab has been working on is the sex difference in immune response. Um, so we're very interested in sex differences in microglia and in myeloid-derived suppressor cells. Um, and the reason this is important is I actually think there's an opportunity to do better clinical trials when you consider sex as a biological variable, right? So for example, we published a couple, paper a couple of years ago that said, look, the monocytic subset of myeloid-derived suppressor cells is enriched in the tumor microenvironment, especially in males. The granulocytic subset of myeloid-derived suppressor cells is enriched in the periphery, mainly in females. And in preclinical models, we targeted each of those populations and showed a sex-specific response. So I, I honestly believe that. I think this is an opportunity. And, and the reason it's important is immunotherapy is being constantly assessed in glioblastoma, right? It's not doing well for a variety of reasons, but what if a lot of it has to do with the sex difference, right? So we're thinking about combination trials, taking sex as a biological variable into account. Well, the, the first thing that pops to anyone's mind with sex differences is, is this the result of differential effects of testosterone and estrogen, or maybe more interestingly, in the, in the cancer cells themselves, is there, like for whatever reason, a sex difference? You mentioned there's sex differences in all cells in the brain. Yeah. The cancer cells arise from the cells in the brain. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, I think it's a result of sex differences from the genetic standpoint, absolutely. It's gonna be the result of sex differences from the glial progenitors, the astrocytes, and the neural stem cells. Now I wanna talk about the sex hormone aspect for a second. So we're starting to do this now. We're routinely castrating and overectomizing, right? You know, those are the obvious experiments to do. The thing that, and this is embarrassing for me to tell you because 
I was in your lab when it was at the National Institute on Aging, right? Right. These tumors arise. You know, the median sort of spike is between 60 and 70 years old, while our mouse models are all young, right? Eight to 10 weeks. So I think the thing that we're trying to do a little bit better job of right now uh, is trying to model these tumors yeah. in older mice, right? Yeah. And it becomes a financial issue, right? Older mice are more expensive. You know, you gotta, you gotta let them sit in your colony or, or get them from an external vendor a lot later. But I think there's gonna be a nexus between, you know, hormones, age, and the sex difference. So I think we're just starting to try to tease this out right now. Now, I guess there's so much variability in, in the, you know, inter-individual and within tumor variability in the, the cancer cells, but I'm just wondering if you, if you cultured glioblastoma cells from men and women who've had the tumor removed, and then, for example, are, can you pick out any statistical differences in their phenotype or vulnerability to temozolomide, this uh, DNA damaging drug? Yeah, you can. So we were involved. So there's a beautiful study um, that was done by one of our colleagues, Josh Rubin at WashU at St. Louis. So he had a science translational medicine paper and buried within that paper is a drug screen using mouse models as well as human um, low passage cells. And for example, female glioblastoma cells are uh, more sensitive to temozolomide. So it, you know, it's, it's something that's kind of buried in the literature, but it, it, I think it has profound implications. Now, you know, if we took 10 male and 10 female uh, patients and we grew out their cells, I don't think it's as clean a difference. And the reason why I say that is because the molecular genetics, the, the baseline molecular genetics are so wild that any effect is likely genetic as opposed to sex. Now, with that said, you can use mouse models. Um, and it's been done before by folks like Josh and others where they take astrocytes and they say, okay, I'm gonna transform these with you know, conventional methods. You know, Let's say knock out NF1, put in a dominant negative P53. And what's interesting is it's easier to transform male astrocytes than females. When you transform both, the male transformed astrocytes are more malignant. You can transplant them. Uh, they have more stem cell characteristics. So there is something inherent in there. Uh, my guess is, you know, it's going to be the interplay between hormones, um, the epigenetic state. Yeah. There's some beautiful work coming out now. And it's been well known, but I don't think we appreciated the ability for sex hormones to shape the epigenetic landscape. Uh, in a variety of tissues. And I think yeah. it's a great example of that. So there could be an enduring changes in gene yeah. expression resulting from, you know, prior exposure to testosterone or estrogen. I, in the most recent podcast that I just put up with the brain ponderings was uh, Eric Nessler. Okay. You know, who looks at the epigenetics of addiction and depression. So he went into a lot of detail and you know, what's going on. So people might be interested in looking at that. Um, talk a little bit more about the, you talked about microglia and macrophages, but of course, that's just a, a part of the immune system. Can you talk about the circulating lymphocytes, the T cells that we hear a lot about with COVID and so on? Yeah. Um, so it turns out that there aren't a lot of T cells in, oh. in these brain tumors. Now, there's a, there's a couple explanations for that, right? And it's going to be, it's not going to be one of these possibilities that I give you, right? But one is there's a lot of elegant work that suggests that in glioblastoma, T cells are actually sequestered in the bone marrow, right? So they can't get to the brain because somehow they're being sequestered in the bone marrow. So that's one example. Um, you know, the other is we like to make an argument that Myeloid-derived suppressor cells, one of their primary functions is to really um, impede the function of cytotoxic T cells as well as NK cells. Um, so when you have a tumor environment enriched in myeloid-derived suppressor cells, you're going to see less T cells. Uh, uh -huh. But I think, I think there's something going on there. I think it's a combination of those two, right? So then the idea is, how do we get more T cells into the brain? And when we're thinking about these, uh, this idea of T cell engineering, right? 
Can I engineer T cells, right? Let's call them CAR T cells for a second. Can I, can I engineer CAR T cells to detect a specific antigen that's only in the brain, like only on a brain tumor cell and kill that? You know, I think we have to be mindful of, of the microenvironment in my mind. And it comes back to that. And what's actually wild, Mark, is the, there's a sex difference in T cells as well. So we're working on that right now. We're hoping to submit the paper, I'd say in the next two months. Um, but I think it has profound implications, right? It has profound implications in standard immune checkpoint inhibitors, right? If there's a sex difference in T cell exhaustion, T cell function, um, it's gonna be read out by you know, patients responding differently to conventional checkpoint inhibitors. So people with glioblastoma, are they more susceptible to infections and because of this suppression of the... Yeah. Huh. Yeah, yeah I had um, Jonathan Kipnis on yeah. recently too, and he talked about, you know, the cells in, coming from the bone marrow in the skull. Yeah. You, you know, the locally. Huh. It's pretty interesting. Yeah. Um, was it when you were at Duke when they started doing the clinical trials of injecting polio, a modified polio virus into, into glioblastoma? Uh, I don't know. If, I wasn't there then. We had already left. And again, You'd I, already, I, I, was you, there, I was there for six months and then I left, but you probably want me to talk about that as an approach, right? Well, I'll talk about, I don't know what's happened with it. I haven't heard much about it lately. Yeah. I mean, I think that the concept is still ongoing, but you know, I think it goes back to the fact that it's a really bad tumor. And I think we've got to think creatively and innovatively and anything we can do to activate the, the immune system, either, either locally or peripherally will be welcome. But I think, again, you know, I'm going back to the, the same message I, you know, I've probably talked about a couple of times, but I think the microenvironment needs to be considered. So one of the things I would argue is that there's a, there's a unique opportunity to come up with combination therapies where we actually go after the microenvironment, right? So for example, we can chelate or neutralize myeloid cells and then combine it with immune activating therapy. So there's a couple of these that are running their way through preclinical models right now and hopefully early phase clinical trials soon. But I think, you know, the, the, the Duke studies are quite interesting, right? Because it does show, you know, for some patients, there may be an opportunity to really extend survival through some non-canonical ways to activate the immune system. And polio is an example. Yeah, that, that was pretty, I mean, I remember they had a press release and it was pretty exciting. So the idea is you infect the cancer cells with a virus and then the immune system attacks them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, that was a pretty interesting idea. Um, so as you know, we did a lot of work on the effects of fasting and intermittent fasting, mostly on the brain. And, you know, you know, probably know Tom Seyfried up in Boston. He's, he's done, he, first he published a couple of case studies of putting people on ketogenic diet or fasting. And yeah. um, so the idea there is um, like all cells, cancer cells need energy. And some cancer cells tend to use glucose more than say ketones. Mm -hmm. And can you talk a little bit about that approach? And, and we know by the way that uh, at least in animals and it seems true in humans, um, moderation in calorie intake can reduce the risk of developing cancers and conversely obesity increases number or the risk. Is there, are there any risk factors for glioblastoma? For example, does metabolic state play a role? It's not that clean epidemiologically. Okay. You know, it, again, I'll, the way we measure body mass index and correlate that is obviously there's a bit of a sex difference. So there is some evidence that, um, obesity may be linked to certain brain tumors. Meningioma is a good example. That's a less malignant brain tumor. Um, there is some meta-analysis that suggests in females that uh, obesity may be associated with glioblastoma. So I wanna talk about that second, but I wanna talk about the metabolic yeah. rewiring yeah. first. It's, it's not as clean as the Warburg effect, right? It's not, 
the fact that these tumors are driven solely by glucose. There are populations of cells and there's a huge amount of metabolic plasticity, right? So there are examples that cancer stem cells, yes, absolutely indeed need glucose. There are examples that they don't. There are examples that, for example, fatty acid metabolism is more dominant. So I think that the only thing that I've been able to garner from this is metabolism is extremely intricate, in, extremely sort of tightly regulated. That's one thing. And then the fact of the matter is there's a lot of plasticity. So these cells are able to use a variety of different fuel sources, right? It's not just one size fits all. Now, epidemiologically, right? We talked about this idea of uh, obesity. Um, and again, for example, and you pointed it out, right? So ketogenic diets being assessed, actually in glioblastoma patients, it's also being assessed, you know, in preclinical models, the, the data are still a little bit spotty. So I wanna sort of highlight something we did a couple of years ago. We had this idea and it was a crazy idea that what if we put mice on an obesogenic diet and then gave them brain tumors? So this is all in a syngenetic system. We also did it in an immune compromised system. And it turns out that if you engraft mice that are on an obesogenic diet with these cells, the tumors are far more malignant. I mean, it is consistent, like you wouldn't believe, these tumors are highly enriched in cancer stem cells. And we did a lot of metabolic tracing. We did a lot of metabolic screening and assessments to try to figure out. We couldn't get anything clean. We couldn't get a targetable pathway to say, okay, well, it's this you know, lipid metabolism cascade. But what came out was something mind blowing, something called hydrogen sulfide, which I know you know about, right? Yeah. So this is the stuff that Saul Snyder uh, has been Yeah, I'm going to I'm gonna have him on in a okay. couple months, I think. Okay, well, uh, hopefully, you know, maybe he'll, he'll sort of give his opinion about what we found. But essentially what we found was in glioblastoma, hydrogen sulfide is a tumor suppressor. So when we put the mice on this high fat diet, the H2S levels bottom out. And what happens is preclinically, we started boosting the tumors with hydrogen sulfide. You can do it you know, with salt, you can do it with a long lasting delivery. Um, and it's actually really wild. Uh, you can actually shrink tumors by supplementing from, with hydrogen sulfide. Mm -hmm. And what's even more interesting is, right, hydrogen sulfide is one of three gas or transmitters, right? Carbon monoxide, nitric oxide, and, and hydrogen sulfide. Well, hydrogen sulfide can post-translationally modify proteins. This, it's called persulfidation or sulfhydration. So we took human glioblastoma samples compared to epilepsy samples, and we actually did mass spec and looked for the number of proteins that were sulfhydrated. And in human patients, they were a lot lower. You know, we were able to confirm that there was less hydrogen sulfide modifying these proteins. Now, where does this leave us? It turns out that you can be very creative and boost hydrogen sulfide in patients. So we're currently writing a clinical trial to do just that, where you know we mess with thyroid hormone signaling, for example, to actually boost hydrogen sulfide. Mm -hmm. So you know, hopefully we'll get a signal there. But but that one sort of took us by surprise. But uh, well, you know, that, but it's, it's it's fascinating from and going back to aging and the, yeah. the kind of anti aging or. Uh, suppressing or slowing down the aging process with caloric restriction, yeah. intermittent fasting. There have been studies suggesting that the life extending effects of calorie restriction in animals are due in part to increased hydrogen sulfide. Exactly. And I would say a lot of these hydrogen sulfide studies were done in close collaboration uh, with the lab of Chris Hine who's a colleague in our department. And, and Chris has been a pioneer in this. He's been very interested. And, you know, we've got a bunch of different mouse models where, you know, we've either overexpressed or knocked out the rate limiting enzyme to, you know, the generation of hydrogen sulfide. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're, we're actively doing this now from a translational perspective. Um, now, the question is, how does it relate to lifestyle as a function of time? I, I don't know. Right, because when you think about you know the median onset of the glioblastoma is between sixty and seventy, so you've got someone following a lifestyle for a long period of time, um, and you know our mouse models are a lot shorter, so I, I just don't know. But I, I do think that there's probably going to be a link in some way, and, but again, it fits with this constant paradigm of obesity 
being a cancer driver, right? Breast cancer is a great example of that. So hydrogen sulfide is a gas. Uh, can you inhale it without any adverse effects or? <sighs> Good question. Um, yeah, I, I, don't, I just don't know. I don't know either. I mean, but, it is it is very short lived. That that is that's going to be ah, challenging. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Challenge is yeah. it's very short lived, right? Yeah. The question is, can you get enough of it in for a long enough period of time to elicit the cellular response you want? Yeah, yeah. Very interesting. Um, now, in the news, oh, let's let's not leave this yet. Okay. I, so in, in preparing to talk to you, talk with you, I, and I didn't know this before. So apparently, these glioblastoma stem cells express a glucose transporter that that we studied in my lab a lot in neurons. Yeah. Go ahead and talk about that. Yeah, I mean, you know, um, they express a variety of the different glucose transporters, and, and you know, I think it's it's just another example. My view on this is it's sort of another adaptability mechanism, right? So if you think about glucose being a very important fuel source, right? Evolutionarily, if you're gonna live in an organ that is glucose dependent, it would be to your benefit to also be able to scavenge glucose. Um, so, you know, again, that, that's, what's interesting is I think in those studies, it was also demonstrated that, um, you know, a lot of our culture media is just way, way, way enriched in glucose. Oh, yeah. And actually the glioma cells can survive even if you go one tenth. Uh, and the cancer stem cells in particular can actually survive in low glucose environments. Um, but it kind of brings up this idea of, of scavenging. And I, I know you wanted to talk about glucose. I'm going to take a left turn here and just sort of talk a little bit about the fact that evolutionarily, the cancer stem cells actually have really weird ways of scavenging things. And one of the things we identified years ago is something called CD36, right? This is a scavenger for, for lipids. Um, it's really well studied in atherosclerosis, right? It turns out that, you know, when you get foam cell development, you know, these, these sort of nasty cells that are involved in atherosclerosis and plaque formation, it's a result of macrophages taking in lipids. But turns out that cancer stem cells do the same thing. Um, and it's, it's, to us, that just highlighted an example of, of how creative uh, cancer stem cells can be, right? Is, is they, they figure out ways to exploit their microenvironment. Right, so they can use glucose, they can use fatty acids, and can they use ketones? Yeah, I think so. You know, I okay. think the ketone area isn't as well studied as the glucose and fatty acids, but yeah. I, you know, there is some ongoing work in that area. Now, um, one way that kind of a classical way to look uh, by imaging at tumors is to give a patient a, a form of glucose called 2-deoxyglucose and, and have that radio labeled with yep. so it's radioactive. And then that, that form of glucose, it's taken up into the cells as is glucose, but then it kind of competes for the glucose uh, and kind of, and actually puts the cells under metabolic stress somewhat. Has, has someone tried in glioblastoma to give them animal models, give them 2-deoxyglucose? Yeah, I think so. I, I think it's, uh, yeah, I, I think it's been done. I mean, I, I'm not as up on sort of the, the PET imaging approaches and, and the tracing that you, you suggested. Um, wow. But, you know, it, it is definitely used. It's it's, yeah, so, I don't know how diagnostic, right? Because it's, it's a little yeah. bit of an intricate procedure. You know, the standard here is more MRI, right? You know? Yeah, yeah. Steve Cunan up in Montreal, he, he de developed a ketone radio tracer. And so he looked in human brain at people looking both at ketone utilization versus glucose utilization by brain cells. And he found if the people are eating carbs, that, that's mainly using glucose, the yeah. brain cells. But if he puts them on ketogenic diet, they switch. And it's actually perfect correlation with blood levels of ketones. Um, yeah, so I think it's really important to, for someone to look more detail at ketones in these 
do they have the monocarboxylic acid transporters, the proteins that move ketones in? They do? Are you talking about like the MCTs, right? The MCTs, yeah. Yeah, short answer is yes. Okay. I, right. But I, so I would point out though, right? So yeah. now we get into a human challenge, right? The, uh, my understanding is the ketogenic diet is actually quite strict. Quite and what? Quite strict. Yeah, fasting is easier. Yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> so you know, the question is, you've got, you know, unfortunately, you've got a terminal diagnosis. Yeah. You know, it's it's something that you know I think is it's a challenge. It's a, it's a it's a adherence and clinical challenge, right? We can do whatever we want in animal models, right? We're really good at that. They're well controlled, yeah. and they do exactly yeah, what it, you know. It's kind of analogous to Alzheimer's disease, where by the time <clears throat> you know, somebody's, you know, diagnosed, there's already a lot of havoc gone, going on in their brain. And it's, yeah. it's really hard to imagine you can reverse that. Um, what about biomarkers that pops into my mind? You know, I, uh, I think I got my PSA, blood PSA yeah. tested a while ago, prostate specific antigen. Yeah. Are, is there a lot of is there a lot of work trying to identify, I guess we could even talk about exosomes because, um, sure. yeah. yeah, go ahead and talk about that. Yeah, I mean, it's right, that's the holy grail, right? Can you diagnose a glioblastoma or for that matter, any other brain tumor in a non-invasive way? And I think the answer is gonna be yes. It's gonna take a couple of years, but the biggest challenge right now is the signal to noise ratio, right? So, you know, the, the basically whatever is being secreted or that interaction's got to get into either the blood, which is the easiest to measure, or the cerebral spinal fluid, yeah. right? So we're not going to lumbar puncture everyone. Right. Uh, that's just, there's, there's way too many risks associated with that. Um, but I think, I think there's a lot of folks excited about this idea of circulating tumor DNA, you know? And yeah. remember, the other thing we should mention is that when, when you do have a malignant brain tumor, right? Glioblastoma has a disruptive blood brain barrier. So there's a chance that there's extra stuff getting out of the brain, also into the brain. So, you know, I think it's going to be a series of detailed studies, but as the technology improves and the signal to noise ratio reduces, I think it'll be possible. So at, at NIA where I was, there's a neurologist, Dimitros Kapagianis, and he developed this method where he used an antibody to a protein you know well, L1, mm -hmm. to pull out of the blood these small vesicles uh, that he thinks are coming from nerve cells, although there may be some other cells. So there's work going on in that to try to isolate these small vesicles and see if they can get. Yeah, I mean, the question is, it, it turns out that you know, these microvesicles, microparticles, exosomes, whatever you want to call them. I mean, they're everywhere, right? Yeah. And then the question is, is there specific cargo right. that can be tracked back to an individual lineage of cells and can that be detected reliably? Yeah. Uh, but again, I think it goes back to as the technology improves, uh, you know, it, uh, we always think about it being science fiction, right? Could you imagine um, getting a simple blood test and being able to actually have some predictive power uh, for cancer. That would be amazing, right? Yeah. Um, gene editing. You know, uh, I mentioned to you before we got on here that I have this mutation in a sodium channel that increases yeah. my sensitivity to pain. And I was thinking, you know, can I knock out, knock out that gene in my, in my sensory neurons by which I perceive pain and eliminate the, the pain, which is kind of a, it's, it's theoretically possible actually, but it's yeah. technically challenging. Can you talk about like targeting these cancer cells and, and changing their, their genome as an approach? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's just like what you described. I mean, all of this is gonna come down to delivery. It's going to come down to efficiency. It's going to come down to delivery. I think people are trying this right now in preclinical models, right, where they're using a variety of the elegant gene editing approaches to actually, you know, correct mutations. I think that the challenge with glioblastoma is, 
the mutational landscape is vast. Yeah. So yeah. what do you actually correct? I will say, in, in my view, the immediate impact of gene editing on glioblastoma is it allows us to make better models, more representative models, more efficient models. And, and yeah. we can do that quite nicely, actually. Yeah. Um, you know, again, there's still some technical challenge with using CRISPR-Cas9. Um, but, you know, it's, it's allowing the field to really make better models. So there, there are some classic uh, so-called oncogenes in which uh, mutations, uh, P53 is one, we studied some. And so I guess it's, it's a really problem with glioblastoma if, you know, there's some cells have P53 mutation in the tumor, but then maybe other cells don't. But if, if you could identify one gene that's mutated and then overexpression. I was thinking of like, for example, there's a uh, non-toxic viruses, this AAB that you could yeah. target to the cancer stem cells and, and put a gene in them that causes them to die as a, as a... Yeah, I mean, it is theoretically possible, uh, but again, it's gonna come down to efficiency and delivery. Yeah. You know, how do we, how do we deliver it, right? Because, you know, one thing you could do is say, okay, I'm going to assume that cancer cells divide faster than any other cell in the brain, which is a good assumption, right? Yeah. And then, you, I mean, you could use a variety of viral approaches that have a high trophism to proliferating cells and do the same thing. Uh, but I think it comes down to delivery. And that's another thing that, that, you know, we should briefly talk about is that I think the neurosurgeons in particular are getting very creative with how they can deliver drugs, right? So we have colleagues that have made really cool catheters that they can put in to the tumor microenvironment and pump in drugs. Um, you know, there's ideas to use things like convection enhanced delivery uh, to increase the efficacy. You know, we've got clinical trials here using um, focused ultrasound, right? So can you temporarily open the blood brain barrier and allow more drug to get in? Huh. But, the, but the key thing and the thing that I think we still have to do a better job of is, right, you can use an MRI and figure out where the tumor is macroscopically, but microscopically, those tumor cells are throughout the brain. So that's a challenge, right? How do you effectively get every tumor cell when it's all over the place? And, and the one thing that struck me, and this was a, a beautiful paper a couple of years ago by a neuropathologist named Craig Horbinski, a colleague of ours, is he's at Northwestern. So he actually looked at rapid autopsy samples of glioblastoma patients. And he found a very tight correlation between tumor cells in the brainstem, right? So these patients had received the best care possible, tumor was resected, standard chemo radiation, but the tumor cells ended up in the brainstem. And obviously you cannot resect the brainstem for a variety of reasons, right? So I think that, that we're at a stage now where we've got to think about how do we get all the tumor cells effectively um, and really prevent them from doing things like getting into the brainstem. Because once they're there, it's lights out. Yeah. Well, what's your most exciting studies going on and kind of what, what are your future directions? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're really active in this sex differences area. Um, I'm really intrigued. It's kind of given us a way to look at the complex biology in a dichotomous fashion, right? It's almost like a parallax to understand the complexity. So we're working very heavily in this area. Um, we also are doing, uh, and, and you know, that one is basic biology and then trying to get early stage clinical trials out. Uh, another area we're working in, uh, and we didn't initially think about this, but in our department uh, is also a series of microbiome investigators. So we're actually doing a little bit there uh, with this idea that, you know, can we alter the microbiome in some way? And for example, we've adapted some of our glioblastoma preclinical models to a germ-free situation, which is actually quite technically demanding, but we've been able to do it. Uh, another area we're working in is that it's, it's becoming well-known actually in the brain of all places that there's actually whole cellular components that can go from one cell to another between lineages, right? So neurons and astrocytes can actually trade cytoplasmic organelles. Uh, 
where the same thing is happening in brain tumors. So we're working on that right now huh. uh, to try to really resolve what the heck is going on. Um, but I think you know the, the, the lab's been very focused in this sort of very ecosystem-based approach where we're, we're really looking at these tumors holistically and basically saying, okay, we have all these different components, right? You know, how is this being orchestrated, not just at the tumor cell level or the cancer stem cell level, but, but everything else going on. Um, so those are the things we're working on. And, you know, one of the benefits of being at a place like the Cleveland Clinic is, you know, we've got unprecedented access to patient samples. We've got great clinical colleagues who, who want to translate. So we've got a really dynamic group that we're working with. So, you know, my, you know there's a lot of things that give me satisfaction, right? You've been there, right? Mentoring great people makes you feel good, doing really cool science, but also can we impact patients, yeah. you know, today as well as into the future? And I think that that's been our focus. It's, it's really translational. You mentioned microbiome and, and at, at the beginning of our conversation, you're talking about kind of an evolutionary perspective and yeah. on, on the, the, the glioblastoma and that made me think so in the microbiome in your gut the bacteria in your gut there are good good bacteria yeah. and not so good or bad bacteria are there any good cells in a tumor that are competing with with the bad cells and could you identify the good cells and kind of enrich the population, have like, you know, the kind of analogous to probiotics or that kind of thing? I mean, possibly, theoretically, right? So if you assume that cancer stem cells are bad, maybe the non-stem tumor cells, the progeny are, are good. The only reason I say that is, or they're less bad, right? Because there's been a variety of studies where you can transplant like orders of magnitude more non-stem tumor cells, and they're not as aggressive. You know, the challenge though, is there's a dynamic interplay. So the non-stem tumor cells actually secrete a lot of factors that drive the, the stem cell program. And yeah. also there's a lot of plasticity in the system. Yeah. So um, it's an interesting idea, right? I mean, it, it almost goes back to this idea of differentiation therapy, right? Can you actually you sort of really lineage commit these tumor cells. And I think yeah. people are working in that, but I think it's a little bit more complicated. There's, I think the molecular genetics, you know, are just too far gone to be able to really bring it back, even with heavy epigenetic alterations. Yeah, the de and then the de developmental perspective is interesting. Um, so we studied a little bit of protein called REST, which it's, uh, it inhibits the expression of genes that encode neuron-specific proteins. And then during development, this rest goes down and the program is activated. So what about overexpress rest? No, 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 knockout rest. Do they have rest? Uh, I think so. Yeah. I think so, yeah. Yeah, no, there's been, there's been some work in that area. But again, I think it comes down. We have, we have a plethora of molecular targets. Yeah, um, it's just again. I, I keep going back to this idea. Yeah, lot, lot. It's like it always is. There's yeah. a million good ideas, and only you got to decide on what you're going to focus on because there's a limited amount of resources and yeah, and time. So yeah, but again, you know, my, my big, my point of skepticism is it's going to come down to delivery and efficiency. No matter no matter what the target is, it's going to be delivery and efficiency. Yeah. Okay, Justin. You cover a lot of ground, and yeah. uh, you know I hope the the listeners will be interested. I'll I'll put in the um, on the YouTube channel anyway in the description section some links to some of Justin's review articles and maybe a few few other things lectures on glioblastoma, so people can if they want to get into that. So it's been great to see you, Justin. Yeah, um, you too, Mark. It's great to see you doing well. Thank you. Okay, bye. All right, bye.